So I will briefly talk about design and performance of exterior wall using a uh, stone wall exterior insulation. Uh, so just uh, maybe a quick introduction about myself. Uh, so uh, yeah, my name is Antoine Abellion and uh, I am the building science manager for Rockwool uh, North America. Um, so before talking specifically about mineral wool solution, uh, just a little reminder, this uh, a rough estimate of heat loss through the building envelope, but you know, it's probably only so accurate and obviously depends on the climate zone and it depends on the, uh, you know, um, the, the shape and the compactness ratio of the house. But just to kind of get an idea, uh, when we look at a typical uh, house, you know, you will have maybe something around 30% uh, percent of heat loss through the roof, 20% through your walls, and then uh, you will have a big chunk uh, through air leakage and ventilation. Um, uh, here you can see there is 5% thermal bridging. So this thermal bridging doesn't refer to, uh, uh, you know, thermal bridging such, such as studs and so on, but really a connection from a, a wall to a floor, for instance, or from a wall to a roof. But clearly uh, it, it, it's, it's evident that taking care of the thermal performance of your roof and taking care of the performance uh, of the wall uh, is something extremely important. And, uh, and that in order to get proper performance, uh, you have to address thermal bridging. So now, uh, not referring to necessarily thermal bridging between the, the wall and a, and, a, and a floor, for instance, but really the thermal bridging within the clear area of your assembly. So for instance, if you focus on studs, uh, you uh, thermal bridging through wood studs. So to remind everyone what is thermal bridging is, it's actually quite uh, simple to describe, but it's basically when you have a material with a uh, high, uh, thermal conductivity that is transferring heat through a, a, another material which will have a much lower thermal conductivity. So for instance, a steel stud through a bat insulation uh, to a lower extent, but still very important, a wood stud uh, penetrating through uh, a bat insulation. If you look on the picture on the right here, it's a bit extreme, uh, but you see steel studs uh, going through uh, fiberglass. Um, obviously it's, it's very extreme, but you can imagine if you, you know, uh, you install this fiberglass and you assume it's, uh, you know, let's say R19. But in reality, in your wall assembly, you have all the steel studs. What you're actually getting is obviously not R19. It's going to be the whatever the thermal performance of the insulation is downgraded uh, by the by the thermal bridging. And in this case, it will be really, really low. Maybe it's really hard to estimate because this one is, this ex example is so extreme, but something may be like R4, R5, if ever. Um, so if we look at a, at a typical wall, uh, on the left side here, trying to compare various uh, performance uh, of, of different uh, type of walls. So, uh, you know, when you, you, you look at the installation, the way we talk about R value is about calling it nominal R value. That's what the uh, installation is rated for. But, you know, the nominal R value can also be uh, basically the R value of your wall when you take the uh, R value of every single layer and you uh, add it all together. And so if we consider a two by six stud, uh, wood stud wall uh, with uh, a stone wall bat uh, insulation in the cavity, um, we will end up with something around R25.1. And the effective R value, so the overall uh, you know, R value of our uh, wall assembly, when we downgrade, we take into account the, you know, the main thermal bridging, in this case, the wood studs, the actual effective R value of that wall uh, goes down to R16.9. Um, just something to have in mind also, the code usually refers as a U factor as opposed to R value. Uh, and so basically the U factor is just uh, the inverse of the R value. The R value uh, basically explain how much uh, the assembly resists uh, the heat flow when the uh, U factor uh, express how uh, basically how much heat flow, the rate of heat flow going through an assembly. So, in order to improve this, uh, you know, R24 byte and two by uh, six uh, wood stud at 16 inch on center assembly, one thing we could be thinking is, well, maybe I can add, uh, you know, increase the, the, the size of my stud and, and put more bad insulation. I guess a more typical uh, idea would be to go from two by four studs to two by six studs. And in this case, uh, let's say we go to two by eight. And uh, well, for sure, we improve uh, the overall thermal performance of our assembly. Obviously, we're adding uh, insulation, but we're still losing uh, a, a fair amount of insulation due to the thermal bridging uh, from our studs. And so a, a better solution, in my opinion, and not just from a thermal standpoint, but also from a durability and moisture standpoint, which I will come back in a minute on, 
uh, when we do this, so by adding in this case, uh, one inch of exterior insulation and uh, going to two by four studs and reducing the amount of bat to a three and a half inch bat, so to fill a two by four stud uh, cavity, we end up with a nominal R value, which is less than the first nominal R value we had with a two by six wall. So we are putting less insulation, in other words, but we end up with a much better effective uh, uh, thermal resistance because we have reduced the uh, uh, amount of thermal bridging from our studs first by reducing the size of our studs, but more important by putting what we call continuous insulation, external insulation, a layer of insulation which is actually insulating, uh, uh, which is actually continuous, and which is going to reduce uh, the amount of heat flow going through our studs. Uh, and so this is often do with uh, with foam boards. Uh, I think it's obviously a very uh, common way of doing this. Uh, but this is also possible with uh, semi-rigid uh, mineral wool insulation. And so here, for instance, uh, these are details that are showing example of how it could be done. So if we look at the uh, uh, drawing on the left, which is showing a vertical cross section, uh, so we will have our interior gypsum board. Uh, and then we will have a vapor control layer, depending on the climate zone. Uh, so maybe we, we don't need one. Uh, but let's say we're in climate zone six, for instance, we may have like a, a six mil poly on the inside, a vapor barrier, or we may have a smart membrane maybe in some uh, in some cases. And then we will have our bat insulation, whether it's filling the cavity or not. Uh, we will then have our wood sheathing and then a water resistive barrier. This water resistive barrier may or may not also be our air barrier. Uh, I will come back on this later, but I would recommend to have it as their air barrier. And then we will have our exterior insulation. So if we move to the uh, um, horizontal cross section now where we see the mineral wool insulation on the exterior side, what we see is on top of this insulation, we, had, we have uh, wood flooring strips. And basically these flooring strips are fastened through the insulation to our studs. And so the only thing that is penetrating our exterior insulation really are, are, are screws. Uh, are fasteners, and so we don't have, you know, a, a, a lot of, of wood framing or metal framing or girts of some sort. The only thing we have really are fasteners, and so this is, uh, you know, a very uh, efficient way of using insulation. Um, this ratio of insulation between the cavity insulation and the external insulation is really important. We'll come back on this in a, in a minute. Uh, this is what it will look like. So we see here the exterior insulation that is installed uh, over our wood sheathing and our water resistive barrier. And what we see is we have the, you know, the flooring strips aligned with our wood studs at 16 inches on center uh, and, and our siding, which is then attached to our uh, flooring strip. And so again, the flooring strips are fastened through the insulation to the studs. You can notice there are a few pins holding the insulation in place, uh, but really, really minimal thermal bridging. Now this solution with mineral wool is usually recommended for lightweight to medium weight cladding. Obviously, the only thing holding the cladding, uh, you know, the cladding is basically suspended uh, on screws that are fastened to our studs. And so the amount of weight you can put on this system is, is, is you know, is limited. But so this system, uh, we would recommend to do it with, you know, any type of siding really, whether it's vinyl siding, wood siding, or fiber cement board. And you could do this with um, heavier uh, cladding type all the way to stucco. Uh, if you were to use, you know, thin stone over a salmon board, for instance, we probably would recommend like a stronger cladding attachment method. Um, and so the question always comes to uh, how much uh, load can the system take? Because, you know, uh, mineral wool insulation, it's not as, as, uh, as uh, uh, rigid as foam. It doesn't have the same compressive strength. Well, as a matter of fact, we, conduct, uh, we conducted uh, extensive testing with uh, third-party laboratories. And... Um, and uh, what we saw is it's a very long, you know, there's a lot of data that came out of this research project. And, uh, and I'm, 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 for sake of time here, obviously, I'm going to try to summarize this extremely uh, briefly, but this are information we could uh, answer you uh, after this presentation. But basically, the idea was to compare this type of system versus a similar system with foam. And uh, what we found is that for lightweight to, um, let's say, medium weight cladding, uh, the behavior of that system, looking at the deflection under the dead load of the cladding, uh, the overall performance of the system was really similar to what you will experience with XPS, for instance. And so uh, if uh, we, when we were to measure the amount of deflection in the system due to the uh, cladding weight, the amount of deflection that we could see was around for the maximum 164th of an inch. 
Uh, if you're like me and you have no idea what 1 64th of an inch is, it's basically a piece of paper that you will fold uh, twice. That's how, uh, how thick it is. And it's obviously really minimal. It's, it's pretty much nothing. That's, and, and is 1 64th of an inch really uh, uh, significant? Well, uh, to put this into perspective, it's actually a lot less than just the natural expansion and contraction you will see uh, with your wood studs, for instance. So it's, it's obviously really minimal. Uh, now, another reason to do exterior insulation is not just to reduce thermal bridging and improve thermal performance, uh, but probably even more important uh, is, to, uh, is to basically increase the durability of an assembly. When you put all the bat insulation, all the insulation inboard of your sheathing, what you're doing is basically you're insulating your home, but you're making the sheathing cold. Uh, if you're in a cold climate, obviously, climate zone, let's say five, or even four uh, and above. Um, but when you're putting all the insulation in both of your sheathing, your sheathing is cold. And if you have any uh, either air leakage uh, from going from inside to outside or any, uh, you know, vapor diffusion through your assembly, the risk that you have is to end up with contraction on the interior side of your sheathing. And therefore, putting exterior insulation will, will allow, assuming you put the right amount, uh, will allow you to keep the sheathing always warm enough uh, that your sheathing is always above the dew point or in other words, or above the temperature where the moisture might condense on your sheathing. So uh, this is a ratio that needs to be determined based on the climate zone. Uh, but uh, to finish something, I think we've already, uh, you know, the, previ the previous uh, speakers have, have uh, uh, obviously talked about this already, but, you know, ultimately thermal performance is, is really important, and, and, but it's, it's somewhat easy to do. Uh, and controlling vapor diffusion is only so much of a big deal. Ultimately, what's really important is to build a, an assembly that is airtight, and, and this should be uh, always thought before actually, uh, you know, uh, dealing with vapor. And so what we will always recommend is to uh, opt for what we call an exterior air barrier approach, where the air barrier will be installed over the sheathing. So basically, your water-resistive barrier will be sealed uh, to also be uh, your air barrier. The reason for this is that uh, you know, your, uh, your barrier will be protected by your cladding, by your exterior insulation if there is, but also it's much easier to install. If you adopt an inter-air barrier approach, you will have to deal with, uh, you know, transition around uh, the wood joists at every floors and so on, and you may be having to deal with, uh, you know, risk of penetration because of outlets, uh, between because of, you know, people installing cabinets uh, in their kitchen and so on. So. Uh, we always recommend the exterior barrier approach and the air tightness of the assembly is really overall uh, the key uh, to good performance. Thank you.